in front of me, I see this kind of an invisible beltway. And there are people gathered inside of this beltway for as far as I can see to the left. What I noticed was that everybody was completely self-absorbed and consumed in themselves and rambling to themselves, a lot of them muttering or there were some people that were wailing and saying things like, if only you had blank, I could have blank. I've created a four month course for my pay what you can roots to Samadhi community that I'll be running from August through November. We're going to be deep diving into the practical aspects of how to develop a deep, tangible spiritual connection. Check the description box to learn more. I am here today with Angie Fenimore, and she is an international best-selling author, writing coach, reverend, empath, charismatic speaker, mother, grandmother, and champion of all that is divine. She also had a profound near-death experience that had a huge impact on me during my deconstruction journey, where she experienced what we would consider to be a hellish realm, and she saw God in Jesus. So thank you for joining me, Angie. I'm excited to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Melissa. Of course. Maybe we could start If you would be comfortable sharing what led up to your near-death experience, how it happened, and then getting into the experience itself. Sure. So um, in a nutshell, I had um, kind of a rough upbringing. And uh, my mom left when I was nine. She joined a cult in the deep in the recesses of Bryce Canyon. And my sister and I stayed with our father. Um, And as you can imagine, you know, a whole lot of garbage and trauma ensued from there, just from the exposure that we had at this ranch and then living with our father who went off the deep end and um, was completely alcoholic. So, and then enter my stepmother who, um, and I've since been a stepmother. So, I, you know, I get how difficult that is. Um, but it was just, I came into adulthood with a lot of baggage and then uh, thought I'm going to get married and we're going to put all that, you know, shut that into a closet behind me, all done with that. And, you know, the thing about trauma is that you bring it forward and you actually invite experiences that are going to continue this, you know, this rat wheel, if you will. And so that first marriage, and um, I like to say we are friends, actually. Um, We were married for a long time, 15 years. um, And it the dynamic was just horrific. It's what you'd call abusive. However, I have a different view of that. I do feel like, you know, if I don't stand up, then I'm in that dance, right? If I don't do something about that, if I don't make some choices, if I don't say some things, and I get that whole experience of being in that place where, you know, you 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 only have access to choice that is presented before you. But whenever I talk about this, I think it's really important to just outline he was dealing with his stuff too. Mm. Okay. And he brought his stuff forward too. He was not one of these monsters who says, I'm just going to, you know, check off these boxes, wife beater, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, but I was in the thralls of that at the time. Uh, I had two boys. They were five years old and two years old Mm -hmm. at the time. We lived in Okinawa, Japan. My uh, ex-husband was stationed there. And something that happened to me that didn't happen until adulthood, I started having this kind of cyclical depression where I would just fall into this depression and severe anxiety, panic disorder Mm -hmm. once every six months. And then I was fine. But during that period, it lasted for a couple of weeks. I would engage in some really risky behaviors. Um, I would sabotage my marriage. I did all kinds of things. I was just two people. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd been doing this for a couple of years, but always when I come out of that phase, I'd be like, 
what in the world just happened and appalled by the decisions I'd been making. And at this point, I've got two little kids. And so I had done this for a few years and just felt like there was just no end to it. I'd sought therapy um, to, with no relief. They didn't even know about, like, the, we're talking, 19, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. There was no understanding of this. I mean, now we now we do. We do have, um, you know, some help available. But at the time, I felt like this was my only choice, that I was condemning my children to this. I felt like they were better off without me. I felt like um, not so much that I was worthless, but that I was... Um, you know, like I was just this catastrophe, you know, when I'd walk into a room, it'd be so much better if I wasn't in it, you know, and that's what I carried around everywhere with me. So I'd go through these phases of destroying everything and then sackcloth and ashes. And so I had gone out to get milk and I didn't come back for two whole days. I went to the movies. I did all kinds of things. And when I finally walked in the door, I was in my slippers and sweat. I don't, I don't even know what I was thinking. You know, frankly, I was mentally ill. Um, and I walked in and my husband and my two children were on the floor uh, praying for my safe return. My husband stands up and he's white as a ghost. And I just really felt like I had no choice. Like this was like a death sentence, but not just for me. It was a death sentence for everybody that I loved and cared about. So I um, made the decision. I penned a little note and um, and I took everything in the medicine cabinet, frankly. Uh, and I did this in the middle of the night. I sent my kids to the neighbor with a note saying, I'm not well, I don't feel good. Um, we had that kind of relationship where we'd send our kids over, you know, back and forth all the time. And I laid down on the couch and uh, then I could feel it happening. It was just like, like an F-15 was coming down in the backyard. My whole body was just vibrating with this roar, like a jet engine roar. And um, I thought that's what was happening. Um, and I opened my eyes and like glanced over at the sliding glass door and Nope, it was not happening outside of me. So I knew it was happening inside of me. And um, and my stepmother had had a near-death experience as well, which she told me about. And, you know, mind you, like this was not in the conversation at the time. So that was my only experience was what she told me. And she had gone to the corner of the room when she was in the ER. She'd been in a car accident and they were working on her. And she went up to the corner of the room and she visited with her loved ones who had passed. And um, so that's what I was expecting. So I am laying there and, you know, expecting that to happen. I open my eyes, expecting to be in the corner of the room. And all of a sudden I can actually feel myself back into my body just like that. And so I close my eyes and wait, 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 this whirring, you know, extraordinary noise and this vibration is building. And so I open my eyes to, to watch and I'm back in my body. So this happened a couple of times before I realized that, um, that I had some choice in the matter, there was some will. And so I left, I kept my eyes closed and I began to will this, you know, call for it. So when I did that, I was sucked into this experience where I could see through my, what I thought, this is all what I thought in that moment was that I thought I was seeing through my eyelids and like this yellow membrane with, you know, these red lines running through it, um, like almost like a drug experience, like this expanded, heightened visual. And then I was also being squeezed like this, arms crossed uh, over my chest and being squeezed. And then I was kind of like completely immersed then in the experience. I could feel I'd gone through a threshold. And then I was surrounded by this yellow membrane um, with the red lines running through it. And I was squeezed like this until suddenly... I was looking up at a woman who looked 
just like me. I thought I was seeing myself um, being cradled like this. And that's what I realized. Oh my gosh, that's my mother. And this was my birth. Like I had the experience of contractions, like I was giving birth as well as being squeezed, you know, like this, like I was being born. I was experiencing everything at once. Um, and what I was immediately struck by was this love and experience of euphoria and peace and just like all is right you know my mom had left and I carried that with me I believe she didn't want me and she didn't love me that I didn't matter to her and in that moment like I really got loud and clear that she wanted me and she loved me I could hear the voices in the room I could experience everything that was happening from everybody's point of view as I started to pass through each moment of my life. I, I left my birth experience and I went to my childhood and I experienced it all, all my whole life, all the way up until the point where I'm lying on the couch. But the way I experienced this is like this, you know, it's all like it did go in chronology, but it was really fast and complete. It was all of my experience, but it was also the experience of those people who had interacted with me, all of the emotion, all, all of it. And so I came to the end and I realized I'm seeing this before a screen actually. Um, and that there is a presence next to me. And at this point, I'm surrounded by darkness. And it's not the kind of darkness, you know, if you're out in the woods where all the lights are off, it's like outer space kind of darkness where you can still see forever. Okay. That kind of darkness. And this presence, I could just feel him. And then I heard his voice. And he said, this is the life you led. This is it. This is your life. There was no drama about it. There was no significance about it. Just very matter of fact, no emotion about it even. Just this is it. At that point, that's when I realized I had crossed over because my stepmother had seen her dead relatives. That's what I expected. And so I swung my head around looking for my grandmother who had passed when I was 14 and a cousin who had passed when I was 11. You know, there was nobody there, but as I swung my head to the right, there was a line of teenagers standing next to me and there were about six or seven of them. And I leaned over and I looked at them and the girl on the end, she had this long stringy hair and she was, she looked to me to be about 16 years old. And what was emanating from her was that she had ended her life. And I had this thought, you know, what in the world could be so bad? that she would take her life. How sad is that, right? The kid next to me, this is when I realized that that communication thoughts are, are audible. Like communication hap is just happening all the time. It's instantaneous and it doesn't require vocal cords. <laughs> anyway, the kid next to me, he was really tall and he was in like um, punker, clothing. He was in a white t-shirt and a black leather vest and black combat boots and spiky black hair and eyeliner. And he looked down at me and that's when I realized he heard me have that thought. And I I had the, the thought, we must be the suicides. And so he looks at me and looks away. And it was just this emptiness that I can't even describe this this uh, death that's like we don't experience here in physical form. It's it's a, it's beyond that. It wasn't until later that I realized that I actually propelled each piece of the experience with my own thoughts and my own actions, that I'm the one that actually was running this show, <laughs> which, you know, it wasn't until later that I put all this together that this thought then brought the next thing, which was that they were left standing there and I was taken through this darkness, standing upright. And I have no idea how fast I was traveling. It felt to me like the speed of light. And I have no idea how far I traveled. I knew I was somewhere on the planet, but it was so fast. I mean, it could have been China and it could have been uh, a football field away. I have no idea. So I passed through this darkness in front of me, I see this 
kind of an invisible beltway. And there are people gathered inside of this beltway for as far as I can see to the left. And my guess is it was about maybe 30 feet deep, 50 feet deep, maybe something like that. There were people, and then I'm dropping down into this space, just like I slow down and drop down in. And I can see others are doing the same, dropping down into this space to the right of me. So it's just filling in. And um, the first thing I notice is that everybody is wearing these filthy white robes, which I thought was so strange. You know, at the time, I'm just like, wow, I would have thought that that was that you don't bring your clothes with you, you know? Same thought that I had about the kid that was standing next to me. It's, you know, it, it just surprised me. What I noticed was that everybody was completely self-absorbed and consumed in themselves and rambling to themselves. A lot of them muttering or there were some people that were wailing and saying things like, if only you had blank, I could have blank. No connection to anybody else, no concern for anybody else. And then this mist of darkness, which was like, um, it, it had mass. It was like this molecular darkness was in this place and it was kind of rising and it was impacting my experience. Like it was sucking life is what it was doing. There was a man who was squatting who was next to me. And he was the only one in this plane who noticed that I had landed, who noticed anybody uh, besides himself. And he was squatting there in his robes. Uh, I knew he had blue eyes. And that was when I noticed I was seeing in grayscale, but I wasn't seeing in color, but that I was knowing all these things. I had this thought. I knew that he'd been there a very long time and I knew that he'd taken his life. And I had this thought about him and I wondered is, if he was Judas Iscariot. And in that moment, as soon as I had that thought, I saw a pinprick of light out in the distance as it's darkness for as far as you can see in any and all directions besides this beltway that is filled with people and filling in with people. And so I'm watching this star out there in the distance and it's traveling at tremendous speed toward me. It stops outside of this, like it's an invisible barrier. I can't see a barrier there, but there's clearly a barrier. Like I know there's a barrier. Um, it's evident that there's a barrier, but beyond beyond the kind of knowing that we have here in this world, in this physical world, it's just everything is known and clear. He stops outside this barrier. And at that point, I can see that he's made of light and his hair is flowing and his robes are flowing and he's just beyond beautiful and he says to me is this what you really want I'm kind of dumbfounded like I didn't imagine that I had any other choice I pro like I had like been thinking about this since from the like for 20 years you know I've been <laughs> considering this. And, and so I'm kind of dumbfounded and I'm like, but you know, I have no other choice, you know, what choice do I have? And he says, you can't pass through the hard parts. We've all done this. You've been a real tool for evil with your children in particular. You can't skip over parts. It's supposed to be hard. I'll just like this pack, like these, this packet of information that would have me re regret that choice that I had just made, right? But my response was, you know, looking at my life and, you know, how it'd been going, I didn't see any other choice. I didn't see like, okay, but I can't, I still can't do this, right? I'm like, it's useless to me. And then I see another presence in this darkness, but what I see are pinpricks of light coming through. And I realize there's some kind of like, membrane of darkness I can't see. I'm not, it's not even like I'm not permitted to see. It's just like, I'm not in a space to see, you know? And I realized that there's another presence there that he's also made of light. Then I hear his voice and it's the same voice that I heard at the very beginning of my life, my, my near death experience with my life review. And he says, don't you understand? I did this for you 
So then three things happened at the same time. So I'm standing there in this plane, this beltway, looking at him. And I know this to be the savior of the world. I know this to be Jesus Christ. In that moment, I am also taken into his body. And I'm experiencing him in the Garden of Gethsemane 2,000 years back. And I'm experiencing him, experiencing my life from beginning to end, like exactly how I lived it. So in that moment, I'm like, I've got no words for this, just blown away, dumbfounded, gobsmacked that somebody else got what I, what my life was like, what I'd been through and what my life was currently like at the time. And my desperation, everything the things that are important to me, all of it. And then I'm also seeing from his point of view in that moment, seeing me in the beltway. <laughs> and I experienced him transfer this information to this other being of light who I knew to be my father in heaven. And like my whole life just packaged up and, you know, like, because you cannot judge another without experiencing what they've been through, right? Like I'm still not in a place where I would go back because I didn't feel like my kids would benefit from from returning. Like, and I didn't, like, this is all happening like this. I'm not thinking, oh, there's an opportunity to go back. So then um, I'm shown what would happen to my children. And my oldest boy was taken to a place of such complete darkness by the time he reached about 20 years old that he was as dark and empty as the kid that had been standing next to me in that line with teenagers, just empty and completely robbed of everything he was meant to do in this life, just rendered incapacitated to perform any missions that he was meant to complete. Just this empty, dark, sad, hollow shell of a kid. And then I was shown what would happen to my second boy, who was two. And he was taken to about seven or eight years old. And then he was taken from this world because he could not do this life at all without his mother. And in that moment, seeing them and seeing what would happen to them without me, um, seeing this emotional roller coaster, basically, of their lives. And that I would I would I had basically sentenced them to what I'd experienced and worse. And uh, in that moment, I issued this minute thought of an okay like really just like it was just like barely there unuttered okay and then I was lifted up above this plane and I could see this below me and I could see these beings dropping in and but I'm above this space and there are these beings of light whipping about me and I say what is this and it's and so God is still speaking to me. And I hear him say, they're helping you. They've always have been. That's what they're up to. They're helping you. And then um, I traveled back to my body. And in that time, I was packed this suitcase of all these amazing things that I would need in order to complete this life, this physical life. And some of it I was not allowed to bring back through the veil with me. Um, other things uh, I was. So I'm, I open my eyes, I'm on the couch and I swing my legs down and sit up. And in that moment, my ex-husband is coming through the door, which is unheard of. He worked at NORAD in a lockdown. You don't come home for lunch, but he just had a feeling that he had, there was an emergency at home and he needed to come home. So he came in and sat down on the couch on the, on the love seat across from me. And um, I'm looking around the room, and this is when I notice that I can still see um, the way that I could see on the other side. And I looked at the TV, and it was just glowing with information, past, present, future, glowing. All my house plans were lit up, alive, bright, white, made of light. And my I looked down at the couch. And I could see the fabric. I could see the molecular construction 
And it was all, all of, it was all saying in unison, we are couch serving you, serving God. All of everything was the pillow. We are pillow serving you, serving God. We are house serving you, serving God. And I could still see that if I willed it, I could pass my hand through any of it. And, um, and I could see light and darkness. Like I could see it on a spiritual level, not just a physical level. I could see the molecular makeup of everything. And um, so my husband said, is sitting there. And I said, you're not going to believe this. And he says, I think I just might. <laughs> and um, so there you have it. It was three days before my 27th birthday. And uh, so I count that as <laughs> the second time I was born. <laughs> Angie, thank you so much for sharing. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? Please do. Feel There's, free. I have so many things. I don't know if we'll get to all of them. But the first thing that struck me about your experience the first time I read it was the fact that it, it seems like maybe our state of the state of consciousness that we're in affects our ability to see other things. Affected? It is it. Can you expound on that? It's it's like how multiple things can be true even at the same time. Like we know this scientifically now, right? But what you believe actually manifests. I mean, it becomes reality. Like no accident that after I, you know, left that my abusive home that I stepped into an abusive marriage number one, because I used the word abuse about it. So therefore that is abuse. That is abuse. Whereas actually it could have been, and I've since learned <laughs> an opportunity to do anything. It's it, this, this light and this darkness, the, they coexist. They never occupy the same space like oil and water, but you need them both to create. And words are the physical manifest manifestation of creation. And when you speak a word and you take an action, but in particular, when you have a thought and then you speak that thought, it is, it forms a physical creation of light or darkness depending on what you speak. So it's not woo woo magic, you know, stuff. It absolutely is. And you could see this by virtue of look, examining other near death experiences, you know, no two people have the same near death experience. And yet you're going to find these 14 points that most people hit. It, it's absolutely, we are creating all the time. And I do believe that had I been in a different frame of mind, I would have had an entirely different near-death experience. I will have another near-death experience when I leave this world the final time, right? So another question along these same lines, when you went to this realm with the darkness and you saw all of these other souls who were unable to think outside of themselves, do you think that is an actual place for lack of a better word, because obviously it's not a physical place, but is it an actual realm where souls go who are at a certain state of consciousness or was it um, a creation of your experience for what you needed at that time? Yeah, I have no idea. And <laughs> here's, but here's like, having had a lot of years thinking about this and turning it over and, you know, studying and actually asking. My experience was that I was not the only one. Like they're all saying the same things I was saying. Mm. I said, didn't I say, but I couldn't do this. You know, I can't, I can't do my life. Just like the woman that's wailing, but if only, I think they were all each individually having their own experience with God. And that possibly the only one that was connecting with God in the moment was the man that was squatting, observing me. But, you know, absolutely. It's law of nature. It's law of spirit that light attracts light. Darkness attracts darkness. That is, it's just you know, a matter of fact. And so absolutely a smile can impact somebody else that then impacts. It's like that whole ripple effect can be felt on the other side of the world. Like absolutely. And so while it's all interactive, I just find this like 
too much for my brain to even deal with. Um, but it's all in perfect order as well. But we are the authors. We are the authors. And yet there's this perfect synchronicity. You know, have you ever had exper an experience where you've had a conversation with somebody and like, what are the odds that you'd be in that line, in that bank at the same time that they are? And they say one little thing that sets you on a different path, right? It's like when your eyes are open, these things are happening to you. It's just crazy, but there are no, there are no accidents. There's no such thing as accident. There's intention. No, I love that answer. And it goes back to that state of consciousness or awareness thing. I've noticed in my own life, since I came to the understanding that the universe is fully supporting me and working in my highest favor at all times, I'm suddenly now aware of all of these synchronicities and these messages that are coming through all the time that before, when I was in opposition and struggling against life, I never heard though. I was just not aware of those things. But we need the opposition. We need the struggle because it's a balance. It, you have to have both in order to have the growth, mm -hmm. right? You can't have it without. So it doesn't even make the, the struggle and the, you know, closed eyes, all of it, closed heart, you know, the things that we deal with. Um, it it uh, It's like, that's not even bad necessarily. Now, I will tell you, I've done a lot in my life to change laws governing violent sex offenders right. to, you know, um, reform homelessness, like all these things. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be at good work mm -hmm. to change these things, but there is no growth and there is no stretch. There's no, you know, there is no opportunity to experience how you're experiencing life if you hadn't experienced it otherwise. Right. right? Right. So going back to the topic of the hellish realm, I don't know if that's a word that you use, but it's commonly used word to describe a realm like that. And a lot of people are probably wondering, I have my own opinions on this, but a lot of people who are raised in a religious background have been taught that certain people are going to hell forever and there's no hope for them. Is that the sense that you got from that place or do you think that everybody will eventually awaken out of that space? Absolutely. Everyone will awaken out of that space. It's absolutely what was required for me in my frame of mind in order to get what I was capable of. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about getting what a bad girl I'd been. It was mm -hmm. about getting like, okay, here's what's going to happen to you, to your children without you. Do you like, I was the only one in my life that thought I was worthless. I was the only one, you know, and there was so much love that I can't even, I, I can hardly even talk about it. It was so much love. And so it's like, at the same time, our value is, you know, like grain of sand universe. It's all at the same time. So, I don't know what kind of, I felt like it was like a way station, you know, and actually what's really interesting is the word that came to me was um, purgatory. And I didn't have a Catholic upbringing at all. Like, and that's a Catholic word. Um, but it, you know, it was just a waiting place for me to get what there was for me to get so mm -hmm. that I could the next place. And fortunately I had not done anything irreparable to my body and I could go back to my body. Yeah. So I love to ask you if you already, I, I can't remember if you said if you had any religious views before your experience, but did you have any? And if so, did they change after your experience? Yeah. So I, my mother had church hopped, like had taken us to every church imaginable just to, you know, try this one out, try that one out. And I joined the LDS church, the Mormon church when I was 14. Mm -hmm. um, I'm no longer a member. Um, I left about 20 years ago. Like, I really don't want to sound like, oh, I'm better than that, than that now, but I grew out of that box. And I have, um, during that time when I was exploring, I, I received the Tao. I practiced Buddhism. I practiced um, Native American religion. I've I went to Christian churches. I did it all. And 
um, I even, because I'm a writer, I was writing a book about a, um, a polygamous family that, um, way back their leader had killed like 38 people. Okay. So I even went to this polygamous church. Like I went everywhere and here was my experience. And that was wherever three or more are gathered in my name. There am I. It was amazing. This experience of, um, of love and connection to God that I could have in all these places and um, of worship. And what I finally came to was really, it's like, if it works for you, get on that horse and ride it. Right. You know, if it causes no harm, get on that horse and ride it. And for me, I'm off in the wilderness. I live on a remote island in Alaska. Currently, I'm on a remote ranch in Southern Utah. That is, that's my worship space. That's, you know, that's where I commune with God is, among the trees and in the dirt it's it's like this argument like no red is better than blue that's really the argument it's like mm-hmm. what are you getting are you being sustained spiritually through this vehicle does it sustain you and support you does it make you feel empowered to go out and help others those, those are the questions to ask mm-hmm. and then if it's true for you it becomes actually true I would love to ask your opinion on Jesus as he showed up in your near-death experience. And I love to know um, who is Jesus to you and what, what did he do for us? Because he communicated to you that he did all of this for you. He experienced your life as you. Was there something deeper going on there? Yeah. So time is not real. Time is, uh, you know, we experience it in this chronological uh, manner because we're on this planet and time is measured by the rotation of the planets and the sun comes up and comes down. But an, a moment is a creation and it's actually not ordered in time. So what was happening there in this garden of Gethsemane was that he was experiencing all of our lives, every every one of us who's ever been born, whoever will be born, experience our lives as if they were his, like he was in my body while this or that was happening to me. He was inside of me. So that, that that's, you know, scripture, he knows your heart. It's like exactly as if it's his own heart because it is his own. And um, so who he is for me is he's the savior of the world. He's, um, my brother. Um, and he's not something that I, he's not somebody that I have to perfect for, or <laughs> he's somebody I can go to <laughs> when things are going well, or that I can thank, or, you know, that's, I have this oneness with him that is precious to me that, um, yeah, I just don't even have words for at the same time, you know, this, you know, I can't even express this. I just don't, I don't even have words for it. Um, but this complete worship, awe, space, you know, of love. Thank you so much for sharing. I was raised as a Christian. And so I've always had a deep love for Jesus Christ. And as I told you before the interview began, I went through a phase of deconstructing my Christian faith. And so I went through a lot of questioning and rethinking and um, wondering about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and was what was really going on there? Is it really what we had been taught? And and I just want to share this thought with you because I want to get your your feedback to it. Recently, I ran across some information that the, some of the great yogi masters like Sri Yukteswar, I don't know if you're familiar with, Yogananda wrote the book Autobiography of a Yogi, which I've been reading right now, and he really brought some of the yogic teachings to the West. And he talked a lot about his master and some of the other yogi masters and some of the abilities that they had, which were completely unaware of in Christianity, at least I was. One of the things that these masters could do if they chose was to take the karma of their followers 
into their own body and experience it themselves. And it would sometimes make them physically ill and they would be able to clear it faster than their students would be able to. And once I came across this information, I thought, wow, that must be what Jesus was doing, except on a much larger scale to be experiencing our karma or our sin, as they would say in Christianity, for every single person in the world. Exactly. Which is exactly why he had to pass that experience to the father who was there as well, is because he was the only one who could do that with complete perfection. I have even mastered the ability to, I, you know, to get somebody else's communication. Like somebody can tell me something and I can process that for them so that I'm absorbing it and letting it pass through me. It is a skill we can, we can learn even. You know, wow, that's fantastic. That's amazing to me. Yeah. And, it, you know, war would end. Um, hunger right. would, would end if we could all do, if we would all do that. Not even could. We can as human beings. Right. That's part of what we've been endowed with mm-hmm. is this ability to, you know, walk in each other's shoes. And yet we don't, um, you know, yeah, this is a skill that can be developed. That's just amazing to me. So you said that you received some information before you came back and you don't remember all of it, but you were allowed to bring some of it back. Could you Mm -hmm. share what some of that information is? Yeah. So um, I saw like that the world comes to this heightened place of like the earth itself won't tolerate the, the, like for lack of a better word, the evil that is here, the horrible things that are happening on her skin. I was, I could see it was um, coming to a head and mind you, this was 1991. And I was told we won't get past 2015 that there isn't like a change in, it doesn't mean all of a sudden, you know, the world is like poof gone. It doesn't mean, you know, like that. Just, I could see that that was a mark in time, 2015 for us. And that when we got like, we won't get past that without this change happening. And I saw it happen in 2013. Uh, That's when like all the, everything, it it was like, okay to be spiritual in public. You know, it became part of the common conversation. You weren't just like a weirdo. Right. Um, And also that's when everything started to shift around um, tolerating inequity in any way. It's like, we're not doing that anymore. You know, and it's like all of the movements, it's like, that's part of the earth cleansing itself. And it's, it's not a battle. It's like the earth has the flu, you know, and there's a fever and you, you know, you go throw up and like all the things that happen when you have the flu, that's what's happening to the earth right now we're in that and we have been since 2013 that's when it began let's see um i was shown that there is no gray area everything is black or white it just looks like gray because it's so closely intertwined but that darkness is darkness and light is light they cannot inhabit the same space i should tell you about my kids too that my oldest is 37 now And he's an RN and he's got a lovely wife and three children. And my oldest grandchildren is 14 years old now. And um, my second son is married and has um, dogs. He's a dog dad. And uh, just, and I've had three more children since then as well. Super close, super tight. Um, Let's see what else was I shown? So much of it has been integrated now, like integrated for the last Mm -hmm. 30 years into my life that uh, it's just the way, oh gosh, um, forgiveness. Forgiveness is huge and being in each other's shoes, um, but forgiveness is access to everything. Like we, we have this tendency to order things like I'm right or I'm not right. And it's really not that. It's like we each have a point of view and that point of view is accurate depending upon where you're standing. So like, you know, I could hold this tissue box and what you see is one thing, or I'll hold it like this. What you see is one thing. And what I see is totally Mm. different. 
right? Right. So it is not right or wrong. It's what do you see? What's your experience? What's passed through you? How do, what did you make that mean in your brain? You know, when you didn't get a bicycle for your birthday and your sister did, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, like even something as simple as that can create an experience of trauma in the brain and set us on a path that's different than another path, but it's all perfect because it's like this tree and, you know, it all, it all leads to the sky, right? So wherever you go up, whichever path you take, you still wind up at the same place. Mm-hmm. So there's that. And the whole time thing, like time's not real. It's like, so that, that one thing allows me to be really, truly happy. Um, you know, I just like, I'm not, I don't get upset very often. And when I do, it's not for very long because I can really just be like, um, yeah, okay. That's really dumb. (laughs) That's your point of view and that's it. Um, so it offers me a lot of choice and Mm. yeah, not a lot of constraint there when you know that number one time is not real and that we're all going to get to the same place in the end anyway. I'm sure when you came back, at least I'm assuming it wasn't like an instant change from all the trauma you experienced to where you are today with the freedom in the life that you're living. So what was that journey like for you? Well, it has been what? 32 years, 1981, right? 32 years you know, there's a lot that has just happened by virtue of growing older and mm. you know, going gray and having raised kids and, you know, all of that and just life experience. Um, but I came back a different human being. I wasn't the same human being. Mm. You know, I, I came back ready to learn. And um, I was just, I wasn't even the same person at all. I got a complete reset. Like I was a brand new born starting yeah. over with tools, mind you, to be able to process all of life's stuff that happens. That's really awful. Right. Um, so I didn't get stuck with baggage as I went through it. So you did have, you come back with somewhat of a change that made things easier for you. Complete change. Amazing. Yeah. Completely different. Yeah. I mean, like I had the same mannerisms and the same memories, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but you know, I would actually have people say, who are you? You know, they, and they, and I'd only shared my near death experience with five people. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was a noticeable change that other people commented on without having known what happened. So was that from the knowledge that you received on the other side or did you undergo a healing also? It was absolutely a healing. It was not just the knowledge, but you don't come back from an experience like that. You know, the same as like, you know, it's certainly not in the same scale, but it's like seeing the ocean for the first time or, Mm -hmm. you know, like what astronauts say about, you know, going up into space and seeing the earth. It's like, you can't undo that experience and it forever changes how you view life and it's impossible, but it's completely all encompassing. It's impossible to go back and be, what is me? You know, it's impossible. So what advice would you have for people who may be really struggling and having a hard life similar to what you did before your experience and may want to reach um, a state of consciousness where you're at today? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, So something that I always like to share also is if you've lost somebody, like I get so much email, people asking, like, I'm so worried he's there. I can tell you, I know four people who have lost people that have ended their lives, who've seen them afterwards, like have come back to visit to say, Hey, I'm in a good place. And that was my experience as well. It's like, I went there because I needed to learn some things. Right. Okay. Um, And if you're in that space, you know, the thing is, is that um, it's like, it's a moment. It's like our lives are this like, like seasons. And, you know, maybe you are in 
the, the darkest winter of your life, but there will come a spring. There will come a spring. And you do have gifts that require other people in order to complete their missions. You do. Um, so find like there are a few things like there's a book that I contributed to as well. I highly recommend this book um, and I'll send you the link to it too. Okay, Melissa, so that you can put it in the show notes. Um, and I can't remember the name of it at the moment because it's got two names like press on is what I remember. Rise above, rise above depression because mm -hmm. press on rise above depression. It is full of like not only my experience of how to overcome and deal with this, but also all of these other people that have also overcome and dealt. Um, and it's a brilliantly written, it's called Rise Above Depression. It's um, Jody Orgel Brown. And um, I am the first contribution in that book. Um, but it's just impossible to say, oh, just suck it up and get over it. Mm. You know? Oh, just have good thoughts. When you're in the middle of that, that is your reality. So this really, it's like, and if you're in a space where you can't even pick something up and read something like that, pick it up and have somebody read it to you, get the audio version. You know, I, it's really hard to make your, make your body do, you know, things towards healing because you get more and more and more stagnant, the more you're in that space of anxiety and depression to the point, well, depression to the point of, you know, not wanting to be here anymore. But you've got to reach out. You've got to talk to people. You've got to tell somebody. You've got to create um, some kind of an apartment. A partner. My sister and I. We. It runs in the family. Depression runs in the family. We have an agreement. No matter how silly it is, no matter what we're dealing with, we call each other in those mm -hmm. moments. The other one will drop everything. We have had that pact for thirty years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to do that. And you've got to surround yourself with actual physical light mm -hmm. as well. Because there are there are spiritual components, of course, inside of light. Like get out of the dark, change what you're wearing, take off the black clothes if you're wearing black. Yeah, I'm wearing black today, but I'm wearing a white blouse. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't impact me anymore the way it did. But I surrounded myself with all things black and dark. Stop listening to dark music. Listen to uplifting, put it on in the background and turn it down so low you can't hear it if you can't stomach it. But that sound vibration is going to heal. It's going to help you. It's going to support you. You've talked quite a bit about light and darkness, and you've mentioned that both are important. Could you share the difference and why each of them are important to our experience? So you cannot have the light without the dark. It's impossible. And so you cannot have, the, in this world, you cannot have any experiences because you don't have the opposite of it. Mm. Now, there's a difference between experiencing, uh, you know, an experience that is heavy, you know, like a death or a divorce, you know, or an illness, than going out and committing acts of darkness right? right it's a different level of and it's a different kind has a different energy about it right but they all all darkness has the same result and that is like it leaves us with an experience that drags us down empty dark lonely right still all those things whereas light you know is joyous and um peace, all of the things that are contained in light, love, right? But in order to have all of that, it, it, we must be able to experience the opposite or we can't recognize it. We mm -hmm. can't see it. It's just not even present for us unless we have the comparison. I In another interview, I heard you mention that most humans are a mixture of light and darkness. And forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but that's what I remembered it as. And you also mentioned that plants are pure light. Yes, this is true. So we're always fluctuating. It's constantly fluctuating, right? Within us, it's changing all the time. Um, you know, what will produce a moment of light, what will produce a moment, a moment of darkness, right? And so it's constantly shifting. 
but um, you know, I can see when I can see it in somebody's eyes when they are engaged in dark matters and mm -hmm. they're there totally. It's consumed them. I can see that. I can mm -hmm. tell, you know, it's in their eyes and you can see it too. Okay. This is just like a human skill. Um, but like as a writer, I like to write um, true crime really is what it is. So I interviewed um, a uh, a man who killed his sister on her baby back in 1984 uh, for three and a half years in prison. And I would say we were friends and he, I saw him get to a point where he was beginning to like the hint of responsibility, take the hint of responsibility for what he'd done because he believed God told him to. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so what was interesting about him was that there was that darkness was not present with him. Now I'm not going to say he was like filled with light either, but that kind of darkness that I have seen in others was not there, which surprised me. I expected something else entirely. And you know, it's like the context is decisive. Like the context for this was, you know, he believed he was doing the will of God mm. at the time, you know, at the time, which changes his perception. But it's like, if you look at war, you know, my father served in World War II. He, um, he helped, um, he was with the company that uh, liberated Dracow and, you know, he came back and swore he'd never killed a soul because it was just like so heavy on him. He would never talk about the war. How do you go through an entire war like that and not take a life? I think that the, you know, the experience of the context is part of the experience of whether or not there's light or darkness, you know, it's, it's just, but I'm not the judge. I don't, you know, I can just, I'm just observing, right? I can just see. And what I'm most interested in is like surrounding myself with that, which I need in order to constantly experience as much light as possible, you know? Angie, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I'd like to give you a chance to talk about your retreats and also where the viewers can find you, anything else that you have going on. Awesome. Okay, great. So we're doing uh, a women's retreat first. These are back to back and a writer's retreat afterwards. Okay. So the women's retreat, these are radiant retreats is the name of the retreats. The women's retreat pathway to peace is August 15th through the 20th um, this year, 2023. And it is six days, five nights in lovely Oahu. Oh, I, I am so excited for this. All kinds of healing happen in there. Um, and then, so it's a Christian women's retreat, but please come regardless of your, you know, belief, uh, you know, tradition. It's like, that's, yeah, that's what we're all about. And then a writer's journey is August 20th through the 27th. It's eight days, seven nights, Oahu, Hawaii. Um, so I will tell you most of my writing students uh, never did considered themselves writers even they just had these stories burning within them and i have a ton of students now who are best selling authors made number hit number one spots won tons of awards um and i'm just it's my superpower it's one of the reasons i came back was for this is um because we're like a book can reach millions and it continues to in perpetuity reach millions, you know, and it's, I, I believe it's the way God chooses to communicate to his children. I get emails like every single day. I get messages from people who were not even born when I had my near death experience that are dealing with stuff. So I don't know, you know, maybe they were whipping around me on my way back. Right. Right. I don't know. Maybe we cross paths, but uh, the point is, is that a book goes on forever and ever and ever, and it's access to making a difference in this world, a legacy of it. So that is what I do is I teach and I train and I support others to get book deals with top deal making literary agents and, you know, top publishers, self pub, if you want to, 
it's just a very, very great environment. So there you go. And um, online writing course, we'll leave the link up for that. It's fabulous. You can go and check that out. I've got all these little pieces that'll tell you all about it. It's an entire program and it's extraordinary and it's highly, highly effective. Wonderful. So I'll have Angie's links in the description. Angie, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Melissa, thank you. I did too. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and comment with your thoughts and opinions and check the description box for the links to my free community where I share lots of resources, my pay what you can community where we do classes and challenges together, my TikTok, Instagram, my clips channel and lovecoveredlife.com where I share my paintings. Thank you so much for your support.